Well, let's get into the word then. Open up your books. This is the book, not just a book. This is the book, the living book, the only book that changes the hearts of people. It's the only thing that will breathe life into the soul and spirit of an eternal being. And so I want to speak tonight about in spirit and in truth. So it's here in John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4. This is a discussion that Jesus had with the woman at the well. And he said some very uh, significant things that's very applicable to us today. And so two words I want to look at very uh, in depth a little bit is, is uh, in spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. So if you're at John chapter 4, we'll start at verse number 21 and we'll read through verse 24. Verse number 21, God says this, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Now you've got to understand when Jesus said this, why did he say that in such a way to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman? Well, she was Samaritan, and their practice of religion was so different and confused than what God intended with the Jews. For one thing, they had a temple that wasn't authorized by God. And they had combined the, not only their Jewish heritage, but also the heritage of all the other people that came into that land at the dispersion. They came in, they combined the pagan religions with their own practices. And so it was a... a it was just a totally confused uh, practice, ungodly. They thought they knew who God was, but they didn't practice it at all. And so that's why he had that to say to her. Uh, in this, uh, you were, uh, back to verse number 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what? We know what we worship. Do you know what you worship? <laughs> Amen. God's good. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so if we look again at verse number 22, it says ye worship ye know not what. Now how is it they didn't know what they were worshiping? Because it was confused. They had the pagan religions, the practice of killing their children and throwing them into the fire and, and all the other practices that the pagan religions used. They had those things that they combined with the Jewish practice of religion. Now of course we know that religion isn't what gets you saved, is it? No, but back then it was very important because they were missing something that we have. They were missing the Spirit. You know, they were looking forward to a Messiah that hadn't come. And here's, just, here's the Messiah standing, talking to the woman, and he tells her who he is. And he tells her what he's all about. And what was her response? She ran into the village and says, Come, meet the man who told me everything. I've ever done. And they came, and how many people responded? It was a good response because Jesus preached his word, didn't he? Well, let me tell you about these two words right here. Know or ye know not what ye worship. The Samaritans practice a worship. You know, they also rejected most of the prophets. They didn't believe the prophets. That's why were they uh, taken into captivity and dispersed. And, and for the most part, the majority of that nation never returned. Some were able to return. Some stayed. But the, they were intermingled with pagans. They, uh, I guess the Bible calls them Greeks. Those who weren't Jews, either Jew or Greek. And so uh, they were mixed. But isn't it so much like our religion of today. 
How many religions don't know what they worship? How many churches are out there preaching a false gospel? How many churches are preaching things they don't even believe? You know, we preach some unbelievable things, don't we? We preach about a Christ who died on the cross, shed his blood for my sins? Now, how is that possible? That's unbelievable, isn't it, that somebody's blood on the cross could take care of my sins? You know something else unbelievable we preach? That three days later, that Jesus Christ who died on the cross, he rose from the dead. That's unbelievable, isn't it? By faith, though, we can believe it. But those things are foolishness to this world. You know why we can't believe things of the Bible? Because the Bible says spiritual things are how? Understood. Spiritually understood. Now, how come the lost world can't understand spiritual things? <laughs> they got a dead spirit. Remember when I was created? I was breathed into existence by Jesus Christ, and he said, let us make man in our own image. Now, what image is God made in? He made himself known to us. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And like unto that, I've been created body, soul, and spirit. But what has sin done to my spirit? Causes it to be a dead spirit. I have part of me before salvation that just laying there lifeless, totally dead, totally unable to communicate and relate to a holy God. I cannot relate to a holy God in my flesh. But if I have a spirit that's living, what has changed? What just changed for me? The moment I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, something changed for me. All of a sudden, I had life breathed into that spirit. And like the picture of, of uh, uh, baptism. I knew the baptism was out there. I couldn't think of the word. Like the picture of baptism, Jesus Christ raised up from the dead. Like unto that same picture, my spirit raised up from the dead. Living. I have a living spirit. I have the ability now to relate spiritually to God. What a wonderful gift that is. And you know, that's not the only thing I get at salvation. What else do I get? I get part of God himself. He's made himself known to us as the Spirit. And I get indwelt with that Holy Spirit. So not only do I have a living spirit, I have the Spirit in me. And what does that Spirit do for me? Oh, that Spirit. What a wonderful gift that Spirit is. It comforts me. It provides for me. It prays for me. You know what it does for me? It empowers me to relate to a holy God. Because some things in my flesh, though I have a living spirit in my flesh, it's hard to comprehend and wrap my mind around it. It's hard to ask for spiritual things in this flesh, isn't it? But I have a Holy Spirit that prays to God on my behalf for the things that are best for me. Do I always know what's best for me? Well, you know, I like to think I know what's best for me. I like to think that I'm in control and that I know what's best for me and that my decisions are the very best. And you know where that gets me? <laughs> gets me in a lot of trouble. It gives me that look from Debbie. <laughs> That's what it gets me. And it gets me in some trouble with the Lord. See, I don't know what's best for me. You know why God knows what's best for me? Well, for a few reasons. Number one, he created me. Number two, he knows all things. He knows the end of every decision I will ever make. He knows the best decisions I could possibly make to get me to the place God perfectly wants me. He knows those things. And he prays for those things on my behalf. Praise to God. 
He's my intercessor. Isn't that wonderful? In prayer, he intercesses on my behalf to God the Father. And I have a friend up there too by the name of Jesus Christ. It's his blood that washed me and cleansed me whole. It's his blood that made me pure. And it's his blood that gave me life to my spirit so that I can relate to a holy God. I can relate to that holy God. Do you know who you worship? As long as you're not part of that group out there that don't even know who they worship. Too much of the world out there worships themselves. It's all about me and my kingdom. It's about my money. Well, it's not about my money. It's about Jesus Christ. What he's done for you, we could never earn nor deserve. And if that doesn't humble you enough, he'd do it again. And again, because how patient is Christ with us? Every day, I deserve the worst from God, and he gives me the very best. He gives me what I don't deserve, mercy. And he loves me unconditionally. You know, I say I love Debbie unconditionally. Sometimes I don't always feel quite unconditionally, though, if you know what I mean, right? When I get in my flesh, I want to say I love my children unconditionally, but there's times that I just pull my hair out. Are you kidding me? But Jesus, you know, he still has all the hairs on his head. He doesn't have to pull them out. He loves me unconditionally. And though I may not always please him with my choices, I may not always do the things that honor God. He still loves me to the very perfect ability he has to love. It never diminishes. And though I do some spiteful things that would dishonor God. He loves me anyway. And he gives me the very best. Has Christ ever given anything but his very best? Oh no, what is the very best he could do? Well, the Bible tells you that there's no greater love that any man should lay his life down for his friends. And who did Jesus lay his life down for? He laid his life down for his friends. But you know, he went beyond that too, didn't he? He laid his life down for his enemies. That was way more than God ever asked of us. He laid his life down for those who pulled the hair out of his face and spit on him. He laid his life down for those right now in this world fighting against him. He laid his life down for those who would go to the grave shaking their fist at God, spitefully cursing him, clear to the grave. And Christ laid his life down and loved them perfectly. Does Christ love a saved person any less or any more than an unsaved person? No. And a proof of his, his blood. His blood was for every living soul, not just a handful. The hour cometh, that dispensation of the law, which was about to end, Jesus was telling the woman at the well. Keeping the law was their only righteousness, but the new dispensation, the age of grace, was about to be ushered in. And it's Jesus' blood that made that possible. True worshipers, those born again, sincerely worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So let's look at that word, the spirit. I can't have any relation to God in my own flesh. It has to come through that spirit. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to relate to God. But how can man worship in truth? So I can worship in spirit. I have that spirit that's been brought to life. I have the Holy Spirit helping me so I can worship Christ with my spirit, with the help of the Holy Spirit. I can worship in spirit. But how do I worship in truth? Well, what is truth? 
We got God's word, right? How much of this is untrue? Oh no, Jesus himself, what did he have to say about himself? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The truth. Jesus is the truth. Who's the author of this book? Jesus. He says he's the word. In John 1.1 1, 1, he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word what? Was God. And if you skip forward to verse number 14 it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And who is that? Jesus. He names himself. He is the truth. This is his spoken truth that's recorded for us. And how often does this change? Never. God's promise to mankind. His word will endure forever. Amen. Truth. There was a man named Pontius Pilate that said, What is truth? Well, if he would have just listened to Jesus, he would have known what truth was. But you know, how is that accepted? How is truth accepted? It's by faith, right? Because as we go along life's pathway, if you take this truth out, what truth is there? Well, then it's up to every man to define his own truth, right? Right? What happened to the Israelites when they came into the promised land and that generation that had experienced the coming into the, uh, the promised land and the, uh, the giving of the, the boundaries of their, their uh, whatever you call them. Um, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> their inheritance, there you go. Uh, they were given the boundaries of their inheritance. When that generation passed away, what did the Bible say about the next generation that rose up after them? Every man did that which was right in their own eyes. And where do you think we're at in America today? We've taken the truth out of our nation. And there's people out there defining their own truth now. And what are they doing with it? They're trying to shove it down our throats, aren't they? Oh, dear. What's the solution to that? Well, God's given us a solution to that too, by the way. Second Corinthians, or Second Colossians, no, Second uh, Chronicles, sorry. This was a freebie. I didn't write it down in my notes. <laughs> 2 Chronicles 7.14 of my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Then what happens? Then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. See, there's a solution as well. It's not about our president. It's not about all our politicians out there doing what we hope is right. Oh, no. What is right is that God's people would call on God's name. They'd humble themselves, repent of their own sins, get themselves right, get our churches right. Then will God hear from heaven. The Father seeketh such to worship him. Who is he seeking to worship him? Oh, those that are saved by faith. Those that would seek him in spirit and in truth. See, Christ died for us. He didn't die in vain, though, did he? Now, how about the mass of humanity that's going off to an eternity in hell? Was Jesus' death in vain for them? Well, no, because he did it for them. Nothing Christ ever did was vain or hopeless or the only hopelessness was in their own folly of rejecting Christ. The only folly is that as a result of that choice in their eternity, they get to go to a place that wasn't designed for them. Hell, made for Satan and his demons was never designed for an eternal soul. Christ 
Nothing he did was in vain. It was for us. We owe him everything. And God seeks such that would worship him. That we do it in spirit and in truth. That we bring him glory in all that we do. All that cause God calls you to do, he will call you to do it through the spirit and in truth. He's not going to ask you to do anything extra biblical. He's not going to add anything to a scripture so you can go out and fulfill that. No, he's going to give you truth to act on. We've been called to a ministry. Every one of us, if you know Christ is your personal Savior, you have a calling. And it's up to you to go after it. See, until salvation, no, I can't relate to those things. And the proof of it is this, a lost and dying world out there, what kind of foolishness is it to empty my wallet into the offering plate? Oh, it's the worst folly, isn't it? Well, if you know Christ spiritually, if you can relate to Christ on a spiritual level, those things make perfect sense. It's very tangible, but how do you describe that to a lost and dying world? It has to start at salvation. And so I encourage you today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you'd make that decision today. Change your eternal destiny. Get life into your spirit. We don't need a bunch of dead spirits. Oh, no. Christ can use a vi revitalized spirit when it has his life breathed into it. There's some spirits out there, by the way, that want to indwell you. Little spirits. But the spirit wants to indwell you. And there's no room for any of those others. You know, uh, in our Sunday school class today, there was a, a phrase that was used. And it was in, a, in regards to financial stability. And the phrase was this, live like no one else so you can live like no one else. And I thought about that. And what a grand statement that is. Live like no one else so that you can live like no one else. Be filled with the Spirit so that God can use you like no one else. Think of some of the, the people listed in the Hall of Faith. They lived like no one else, and they're recorded in the Bible for our encouragement today. Live like no one else. Live spiritually filled every single day that God could use you in a spiritual way. And it may not be on some grand scale that, that men would, but in God's eyes, the little things are just as grand as the big things, aren't they? Just as important as those Little things and big things. Christ wants your heart. Give it to him. Let's pray.